listen to this. An estimated 600,000 Canadians have criminal records for marijuana possession. Does that number shock you? In 1998 alone, 19,200 adults and youths were charged for having marijuana. This is the drug that the Canadian Medical Association says is the least harmful among all psychoactive substances. Now, this has struck many people as stupid and wasteful, but uh, very few of us go to the barricades to fight about it. Mark Emery uh, has been arrested 10 times. His offices have been raided four times. He's been jailed eight times, which is why I scheduled Eddie Greenspan right after his presentation. Um, Mark is the prince of pot. He's the world's largest purveyor of pot seeds. And uh, he wants to become a politician of pot. I just, I just want to add, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Mark organized the Marijuana Party of British Columbia. And there was a moment there heading into the election where it looked as if the Marijuana Party of British Columbia might just form the opposition. <laughs> and what an opposition it would be. It's a, I was going to say I'm proud to say, but really it's just a matter of fact that I have a criminal record easily longer and more arrests than all the people in this room combined. And, and yet I'm still really, really lucky. I've had all my assets seized four times. And I've actually been arrested over 20 times in my activist career in Ontario and British Columbia. I never leave the country because the U.S. government considers me a major drug trafficker and would issue a warrant for my arrest if I left the country. And I must say, I spent most of my adult life, if not all of it, fighting the Canadian government, fighting all the governments, fighting my fellow citizens, and fighting for this cause generally. And I still love this country. Maybe it's because contrasted with what it would be like anywhere else. If I were in the United States, I would be facing the death penalty for what I do. I've sold to over 70,000 people, most of them Americans, I'll confess. And by the way, this is my confession. And you are my witnesses, because I'm not sure this can go on. And uh, so if I just get withdrawn out of circulation one day, you'll, you'll know the full story. I've sold over two to three million marijuana seeds of unbelievable power potency. I can sell you a seed that can give you a plant of any size, shape, color, smell. I can have it so it grows in the Arctic Circle. I've actually got a guy growing in Baffin Island and has one little house and he needs a strain that finishes before the RCMP visits every three months. <laughs> and he's all by himself and it's just one room and he has no way to hide it. So he says, I have to strip it all down just before he arrives and put it back up just as he leaves. I've got strains for every part in the world and I've sold seeds to almost everybody in the world. And those seeds have produced probably, I know, conservative estimates as a way to do this, about two and a half million pounds of marijuana, which even at the lowest Canadian wholesale rate is about five and a half billion dollars Canadian that I've helped empower people with. I look at it that I'm empowering them. I belong to the cannabis culture. I'm very proud of that. It's the most wonderful, beautiful plant. Carl Sagan, who was a pot smoker every day of his adult life, if you didn't know, said that marijuana was the earliest cultivated plant by man, that we took it from the wilds and we tilled it in a field because basically Jesus wore that cannabis. In the old days, the biblical period, I guess, or the prehistory period, we tended to wear clothes of flax and cannabis. Those were the two things cotton hadn't been mass processed yet. And clothing was a very expensive labor in those days. And hemp grew all throughout Mesopotamia and the Middle East. and. Uh, it's been with us a long time. Of course, old traditional medicine used cannabis as a balm for so many wonderful treatments to ailments that would kill people or have them lose their senses or certainly make them very sick and ill. And of course, that continues to this day, and that's a great concern of mine. But in the United States, if you're convicted of selling more than 60,000 60, seeds, each seed is considered a plant there. It's the death penalty. You're considered a major drug kingpin, and they can sentence you to death. So I've always thought, well, that's both a terrible thing and a terrible, a wonderful contrast that I'm still walking here and after 20 some odd convictions, I'm still not even on probation. 
So it says something both wonderful and horribly contradictory about the country I live in, because not only have 600,000 Canadians have criminal records, but about twice that many have been arrested and roasted for marijuana. I regard it as sexual assault. Most police strip search people and pat them down. That's totally, utterly shocking in this modern era that the police officer can take someone's clothes off and investigate their bodily cavities just to look for a, a gardening project. <laughs> And that's what it is. You know, in Vancouver alone in the last year, over 50 families lost their children because they were growing marijuana. You know, people lose their property, their cars, their homes, their valuable belongings all the time over marijuana. You know, if you actually assault or rape someone or even brutally murder someone, you actually don't lose your house. You don't lose your property if you commit a violent crime, but you do if you grow marijuana in your home. And such things are unresolvable to me. I said, how can I grow up being taught? I remember in centennial year, 1967, they gave me that beautiful centennial coin. And I was constantly reminded when I was young that we live in a, a free country, a country of liberty. And, uh, and we're the most proudest democracy in the world. But people have been getting arrested for this and rousted and ha losing their jobs. You can't travel to the United States if you have a criminal conviction for marijuana. It's quite possible you can't travel to other countries. It's certainly likely that you'll be difficult to get a job in certain sectors. You could lose your children. I know we risk losing our children all the time. I have four children in their 20s whom I adopted. My partner was constantly concerned the police were gonna come and take them away from my activism. We also homeschooled. I got arrested, we got convicted twice of that too, amongst many different convictions. None, nothing unsavory, by the way. I like to point that out. These are all things that I really believe in. And 30 years after marijuana arrests reached about 35,000 to 40,000 a year in 1970, it still goes on. And you know, I've been distributing marijuana throughout our parties and people have gleefully and gratefully accepted them. And every time we celebrate, there's a teardrop inside me though, because on one hand we celebrate like, like it should be, like it's a wonderful celebration of joy and conviviality and friendship. And, Marijuana brings people closer together. It makes them talk. They all have fun. I didn't see anybody not having fun. And yet, a million people in Canada, Mexico, and the United States this year will get arrested for marijuana. 650,000 US, over 200,000 in Mexico. About 40,000 will be arrested. Perhaps only 20,000 will be convicted in Canada. A million people every year having their lives ruined. You know, there's tens of thousands of children who grew up in Canada with one or two parents in jail for periods of more than a year for marijuana. There's probably people in this room, I know many, many people in the media I met as camera operators and reporters have said they've gone to jail, they've been convicted in their lifetime, often in the 70s or early 80s or even late 60s, but they've gone to jail and it's affected them ever since. No visiting relatives in the United States, no travel. And anybody who smokes marijuana looks over their shoulder basically every day of their lives. So I grew up, I was really good with money really great with money. My parents used to give me, when I was four years old, they'd give me four cents a day. That was my allowance, four cents a day. And I'd save it in a piggy bank, which I presumed a lot of us did. I had a piggy bank and I saved it. But every day I'd get all my money out and I'd count it up. I'd put all the pennies from 1946 in a row and I'd put all the pennies in 1947 in a row and all the ones from 1940. And then I'd stack them up in rows of 10 and then I'd stack them up in rows of five and I'd recount them in every configuration I could. I just loved the idea that that money was there, waiting to be used for something. I didn't know what, but for something. I've always been really good with money, and I've always had a passion for the suffering of others, to see it alleviated, to see it dealt with, to, gee, to bring liberty into reality. You know, when I started this, I was 20 years old, and now I'm 43, and I'm having this awful feeling inside that, oh my God, I could die. I could die at 62 or 65, and nothing could have changed in my whole lifetime. Is that really possible? Could a million people in North America get arrested and have their lives ruined every year? in that huge space of 40 years and nothing could happen. So I'm at that halfway mark. You know, I'd already received the death, I would receive the death penalty if I was in the United States. I've, I receive so much money for my sins that strangers send me in the mail. People I don't know send me two to three million dollars just to me every year, or every day rather. That total is, sorry, that's a yearly total. I, I must have said something like that to the National Post. They said I said I make $14 million a year. And last week they called me an eccentric millionaire. And I knew I was turning the corner on father time. Because they usually call you an eccentric person when you're harmless and old. And I've been doing this for so long and I thought it's finally true. I have gotten old, hopefully not harmless. So I've been 
I became the world's largest seed seller of marijuana seeds. I can help people grow marijuana under any circumstance, and I do. And I charge people a lot of money. I charge them more than anywhere else because I tell them, you should give me this money because I have so many important things we have to do to make marijuana legal. So I use these money, this money for a variety of things. I, I'm paying for the Supreme Court challenge that goes before the Supreme Court of Canada later on this year. I'm paying for all the photocopies, which is like twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 alone, and uh, all the other fees. I've uh, given millions of dollars away in the last couple of years. It's a wonderful thing to be able to do that people send me this money. And my markup is so great that on three million, I would probably have a million and a half dollars that I could give away in a year. And so I do. I decided to use every means possible to make marijuana legal, everything I could think of. I have a magazine that comes out bi-monthly called Cannabis Culture Magazine, and it details the tribulations and travails of all the people who are victimized by this terrible, terrible drug war. And it's a drug war where most of you would agree marijuana should be legal. The public agrees marijuana should be legal. I believe the public has always felt that it's unjust to jail people. Or as I ask, why, even if marijuana is unhealthy in every possible way that's ever been described, how does that justify putting anyone in jail, let alone 600 and some odd thousand people? Because you do go to jail when you're arrested. You know, you go to, they put you in jail overnight if you're selling, if you're growing, oftentimes if you're in possession. They take away your car. If you even have marijuana on you while you're driving, they'll just say you're impaired and your license is suspended for 48 hours. No proof is required. When marijuana's around, all the presumption of, of guilt is right there. You're already guilty of something. And why is that? Like, why is marijuana illegal? How did this happen? And it's a, it's a thing Canadians don't really know. You know, marijuana was made illegal in this country in 1923, and nobody had ever tried it at that point. It was made illegal with not a single doctor aware of its use. Not a single person ever testified to saying they smoked it. There was no evidence of any criminogenic behavior of anybody ever smoked marijuana. It was made illegal in 1923 by a woman, and this eats at me every day of my life. She's on, in a statue on Parliament Hill. The woman responsible for our oppression who convinced the Canadian government to make marijuana legal has a statue to herself on Parliament Hill. Her name is Emily Murphy. She was an Alberta magistrate. And it eats away at me that she's sitting there in iron, looking over Parliament Hill like some watchdog vulture of prohibition, <laughs> making sure they never go back on what they have done. Emily Murphy was a terrible racist eugenetics Orange Lodge member. And, I felt, and in, she disliked Chinese people immensely. She wrote a book called The Black Candle where she said the Chinese were subject to depravity and of no worth whatsoever. And, you know, she's saying we've got to stop this from happening further. So she read that, you know, the jazz musicians, black jazz musicians, which were just coming up from New Orleans and St. Louis, were smokers of marijuana. And that these surly and swarthy Hispanics were smokers of marijuana. And we had enough Chinese here. She said, we don't need the blacks and the Hispanics. So if we make marijuana legal, we can do what we've been doing to the Chinese for the last 25 years, and that's deporting them, getting rid of them. The Chinese smoked marijuana. That was our first, mar our first drug law in Canada in 1908, the Opium Act. And it was designed exclusively just to get rid of the Chinese. And drug laws are always that way. They're always done, designed to get the marginalized people, young people, anti-war protesters, beatniks, hippies, you know, counterculture, dissidents, troublemakers, anarchists, socialists, drug laws are used to clear those people out of the way of the eyes of, of society at large, the establishment. And this, it's a, it's a big, huge tragedy that goes on and nobody in Parliament's ever spoken up against it. John Turner was here. He was in government for 15 years, 18 years, in cabinet, virtually all of it. 300,000 people were arrested and convicted while he was in government. Not a word was spoken. He wants the best and the brightest. Mm. Well, probably a lot of them have criminal records. <laughs> and, and the Right Honorable Kim Campbell also was a Prime Minister. I asked her, she's, he's, she's here, I was honored to ask her, why didn't you do anything? And she said it wasn't an issue back then. So that's it, is it? Like human justice, individual freedom, just doing the right thing has to be on the agenda. Well, it's never been on the agenda. 30 years they've been rounding up people. I've never seen it on the agenda, ever. I've never seen a single parliamentarian get up and speak about these terrible and holy marijuana laws that for no reason that anybody's ever said. I've debated members of parliament on TV and not a single one has ever answered me. Why, if everything you say about marijuana is true, it being harmful or whatever, why should anyone go to jail for that belief? 
No one goes to jail for snowboarding or eating fatty foods that kill people. Obesity, <laughs> obesity is a major problem. Nobody goes to jail for being obese, even though they pose a threat to themselves and to the healthcare system. And who knows, those they love may go without their loss. I mean, people indulge in drugs like alcohol and tobacco, which obviously kill hundreds of thousands of people. And frequently, lots of people die. We engage in dangerous behavior all the time. Sex will kill you. Lots of people die from sex, from AIDS. It's not illegal to spread diseases that kill people, because we don't really mean to do it, I suppose. But marijuana, which has been exist in existence forever, it's been used forever, by every culture on Earth grows marijuana. Every town, hamlet, city on this planet has somebody growing marijuana. There are marijuana enthusiasts and lovers in every country and every culture. It's a sacred religion to five groups on this Earth that use it as their religious sacrament. It's used for clothing, it's used for medicine. There's just, you know, you've read in the paper, people who are crippled up, bent up, dying of AIDS, six months to live for cancer, throwing themselves prostrate on parliament because they need medical marijuana. All they really want is a little exemption, a little piece of paper that they're begging from the current health minister, or the current justice minister, please just let me have marijuana without having to go to jail. My friend Grant Krieger yesterday was found not guilty by a jury of his peers because he's been dragged in and out of jail for selling marijuana one, a cost to other people like him who have multiple sclerosis and hepatitis C. You know, there's just so many people in this country who have bad illnesses. I'm grateful I'm only looking at the death sentence if I get sent to the United States. Some people live in pain right now, every day, and they're already facing a sort of a death sentence, a cell around them, crippled up in pain. My own personal assistant, Michelle, she has Crohn's disease, a terrible bowel disorder where your intestines slowly rot away and creates internal bleeding and tremendous pain that's kind of always there, always present. She used to take a whole lot of pharmaceutical drugs and now just smokes marijuana and it's been the most effective bomb for what is really ailing her. And this is so true with, with hundreds of thousands of Canadians and all they really want is just the permission to have this. They don't want anybody to pay for it or to provide it for them. They just don't want to have to look over their shoulder and risk going to jail. They all have children. They'll all miss their children. Their children will have to explain why their family and parents are in jail. I've seen it so many times. The tragedies are so great. So what I've done is I got really good with money. I've always been really good with money. And I sell all these seeds, and then I use it to do whatever I can to change this terrible system. So we actually, I, I decided I'm, I'm going to organize a political party, and we did it in January of this year. And I said and we're going to try and find a full slate of candidates, because it's never been done before. We became the first party in British Columbia's 100 plus year history, actually it's 130 year history, but in the last 100 years no party has ever fielded a full slate of candidates in its first election and we shocked everybody. We got our shit together, we proved that a motivational syndrome is a complete myth. We got <laughs> all 79 writings. And we bombarded the province of BC with our message that why? Even if everything everybody believes about marijuana is true, why should any of us go to jail? And furthermore, why should you want to pay for it? Why do you pay billions of dollars on a drug war to put your neighbors? Who's smoking this marijuana? Your children, your parents, your neighbors, the person next door. These aren't undesirables that are, that are living in some masked you know, existence away from you. These are your neighbors, these are your teachers, these are your friends. And the funny thing is we're all in denial. I never met anybody, 90% of the people never admit they smoke pot. I bet most of the people who smoke pot at these parties that we've been at aren't going to go tell people, I'm a pot smoker and I'm proud of him, we should do something about the situation. That's what I encounter all my life. Nobody actually ever speaks up. It's the world's biggest kept secret. Now, every country on earth, marijuana is illegal, and every country on earth, huge amounts of the population smoke it, enjoy it, believe in it, use in it, live safely, live healthily because of it, and yet they're all frightened to speak, speak up. They all have laws that have these horrible punishments, well beyond anything you can imagine. Like, I just don't know of a group of people of 600 to a million Canadians who basically went to jail for their lifestyle. I know gays, never do, that doesn't happen to gays, doesn't happen to women, doesn't happen to anybody of any ethnic base, background. It doesn't happen to anybody who's got a religious belief, a philosophical belief. It doesn't even happen to people who own guns. It doesn't happen to people who have any other lifestyle choice that I can think of in this country. They're not rounding people up every six minutes and putting them in jail. They're just not. And you're my hardest audience to ever convince of this because the wealthy and the affluent can buy their way out of situations. You know, the well-employed and the well-connected, they don't go to jail in quite the same way as the vulnerable, people of different skin color, people <coughs> don't speak the language so well, First Nations people, young people, hippies, 
Those are all the people that are usually targeted. Vietnamese people are targeted in Vancouver as for growing marijuana. You know, actually, drug culture has always flourished in immigrant cultures. You know, in the 1920s, the Jewish mafia was the distributor of drugs, and then it became the Italian mafia. And as new ways of immigrants arrived, in fact, in Vancouver, it's Vietnamese people often, and Hondurans, because it's the only job they can get in a white culture, because if they don't speak the language, it's difficult to get a job. So they immediately integrate into an area where there's a very good return on something that white people really want. And here's the irony, too, by the way. They passed that law in 1923 to keep out all our swarthy, dark-skinned neighbors. And the irony is, is they've been arresting white people in Canada ever since. So it was completely <laughs> unintended. The unintended consequence of this law, which was to keep out the other, we have made the enemy us right here. So we are now responsible. And you're all tacitly responsible for this, if not explicitly, because it's your silence that gives the government the consent. Kim Campbell said it wasn't on the agenda because nobody here put it on the agenda. Nobody helped make it on the agenda. You've got to get it on the agenda. You've got to do more than talk about it, too. You've actually got to take a risk that even if you don't smoke marijuana, and that's what I'm really waiting for, the people who don't smoke marijuana, to get up and say, this is still wrong. We shouldn't do this to anybody. We should never be arresting people, ruining families, destroying lives, and having a police state in our country that costs us billions of dollars of taxpayers just because somebody makes a choice in their own home to do something I don't understand. That's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the people who don't smoke marijuana to finally get out of the closet and stand up for the liberty that we accept in our national anthem every time you hear it. Every time you hear it, we stand on guard for thee, the true north, strong and free. Is that really true? Do you really ever believe that song? Because every six minutes of every day in Canada, somebody's being arrested for marijuana. And you know what? They don't just arrest you. If they want to arrest you for a rape, they come to your door, two men, and they say, we have a warrant for your arrest. You'll have to come to the station with us. But when they arrest you for marijuana, there's eight guys with flak jackets and semi-automatic assault rifles with stun weapons and smoke grenades, and they often have battering ramps to smash your front door down. And then they come in, in the, usually in the middle of the night, and rip you right out of your bed and drag you down and put their knee to your back and put handcuffs around your arms. And then they search your house and ransack it and usually leave it for wasted. For what? For a gardening project that's in your house. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And it happens, that happens every couple of hours of every day in Canada. And there's no reason for any of that. That's all insane. It's all insane. You know, if you took away the word marijuana smoker and put Jew, it would be a pogrom. What you can't travel, what you can't practice your beliefs, what you can't grow your own, you know, cook in your own home, you can't have your own rituals, you can't have your own lifestyle. It would be a pogrom. I wrote about a pogrom of a woman who went through the Holocaust. And, you know, people don't like referencing other people's tragedy. It's somewhat callous to take someone's suffering and tragedy and apply it to a different situation. But I can't help but think that something that's gone on for 30 years with the tacit approval of everybody in this room, with the tacit approval of everybody in this country, with the silence of everyone in Parliament, of every Parliament, not just in Ottawa, but of every Parliament in Canada, this incredible silence while this goes on hour by hour by hour, I just don't understand it. We're all smart, intelligent people. We all grew up with a fairly good educational system. We all have mass media. We can see this tragedy and read about it every day in the papers. Marijuana is in the paper every day. And basically, that's the passion I brought to the idea that we should have 79 candidates running in every writing to remind everybody, to guilt trip them, to repeat over and over, why does this happen every day in this country? Why does everybody do nothing? Why isn't it not on the agenda? What's wrong with you? Aren't you good Canadians? At the same time, though, politics is a very finite thing. The election's over, we had 79 candidates, we got 3.5% of the vote, 54,000 votes. We made a big impression, we got tons of good media, I was so proud of everything we were able to do. But that doesn't stop there. And that cost me a quarter million dollars, by the way, I paid for all that. The money that people send me, this is a great irony though, and it's kind of a little bit of a nice feeling inside, that everything I've done is basically from the proceeds of crime. So I've kind of got this good thing <laughs> where everybody sends me this money that it's illegal. That's why I've been raided four times. I had $800,000 in all my assets taken on four occasions. They just take everything I own and then walk away. So I know what it's like firsthand to have them come in and take everything you own, except your identity, and then walk away and try and ruin you. And that's clearly what they, four times they've come by because I do sell these seeds. They are illegal. I've done it every day for seven years. And they know I use all this money to basically subvert the system because the system doesn't respond. Democracy didn't work. Then injustice goes on every day and no one does anything. I've never seen it. You know, we're letting the sick and dying throw themselves prostrate on Parliament Hill in order to get laws changed. I'm thinking, what? We're letting people who have six months to live 
find liberty for all of us? That's a terrible thing. What a terrible thing to do to people that the healthy and the wealthy and the affluent and the safe and the secure, the people right here, won't do anything so that the people who are emaciated, dying of cancer or hepatitis C, actually have to throw themselves prostate on Parliament Hill to get some kind of justice? Oh, we've failed. But, like I say, I get a lot of this money, so what we're doing is we're opening a chain of medical marijuana dispensing of units. It's called the Compassion Network. It's under the BC Marijuana Party name. And we opened five of them on October 1st, and basically some of the money I, use, uh, I get will be used to subsidize marijuana at a low cost to poor and really sick people. And there are so many of them. People on hepatitis C find incredible relief from marijuana. People with, women with multiple sclerosis find marijuana incredible. People with AIDS. You know, it's one thing when we hear about nausea, but you don't know what kind of nausea you get from chemotherapy. Oh, people who've had cancer treatment will certainly know. It's the most compelling kind of, you can't keep anything down, you violently throw up at the, during your chemotherapy process. And marijuana is about the only thing that works in giving these people enough for nausea control so they can get food in them so they just literally don't waste away. That's what happens, they'll just simply waste away. They won't be able to eat, they won't keep food down, and they'll waste away, so marijuana, is a lifesaver to these people. And there's hundreds, I've got hundreds and hundreds of stories, people crippled up and in terrible ways. And so we're gonna open a chain of medical marijuana dispensing outlets five every three months until in the year 2000 we have 30. And we'll give marijuana away to these people at less than cost or cost. And hopefully this will be something that will both challenge the law in a way that forces them to confront us. I don't know, maybe they'll come and finally get me because now we're selling pot en masse in different locations to people who need it. I'm selling seeds every day, and of course the United States sooner or later is gonna send an extradition warrant for my arrest because we believe in doing this worldwide. It's a worldwide revolution. Every country has these horrible laws. So think about that. You're safe, you're secure, you're affluent, you're educated, no one's gonna hurt you. So please consider all those who aren't as well off as you, who don't have the security. Your children, for example. They're very vulnerable. Your parents will start wanting medical marijuana much more than you think because medical marijuana will help so many things that elderly people suffer from. And I thank you for listening to me. And I thank Mr. Zmenier for inviting me. And I really hope you'll do something because there's no tragedy in this country, anything like this. And if we want to have the best and the brightest, and let's make sure we do, and let's take all those criminal records off, you have the power to liberate a nation that's waiting for you to do something. Thanks very much.